Hi, everyone. Janelle Clevenger McLaughlin states in her book, Leadership at Every Level, many teachers don't see themselves as leaders, but they are. They're the leaders to the students in their classroom, to the students and adults they encounter in the hallway, and like it or not, to the stakeholders with whom they interact in the community. Effective leaders are relational, innovative, and flexible, have high levels of integrity, and are lifelong learners. Effective leadership is really about the head and the heart. Good morning. Ah, see, I did it. Good evening, everyone. Good morning for me. Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome. Uh, my name is Peter LeBlanc, and I'm the coordinator of the leadership arm at The Mentoree. I'm the moderator of our conversation on widening the leadership lens tonight, and I'm here with Christine Chin, who is making things happen behind the scene, as well as our four panelists, who I will briefly introduce here. We have Marguerite Campbell, a retired superintendent for the Toronto District School Board, current coach leader and part-time instructor at Sir Wilfrid Laurier University. Good evening, Marguerite. Hi, Peter. Uh, we have Che Cheney and Pav Wander, teachers of middle school age students with the TDSB and co-hosts of both The Drive with Che and Pav and The Che and Pav Show, uh, both hosted on Voice Ed Radio and at cheandpav.com. Hello to you both. And we also have joining us Brenda Sherry, who is co-learner, collaborator, connector, coach. I'd also say alliterator extraordinaire. Uh, Brenda is currently involved in numerous educational projects, including Connected North uh, and Advanced Learning Partnerships, to name but two. So I want to say welcome, and I want to say thank you to all of you. Our panelists will get an opportunity to introduce themselves with greater detail, as well as share their leadership narratives in a few moments. I'd like to first kind of place our time together today in a bit of context. So for many of us in education, our narrative path of leadership seems to lead kind of towards the school office and the district office. But as our quote highlighted earlier, and we'll actually be giving away a copy of Janelle's book to a lucky listener at the end of our time together today, uh, leadership is so much more. So she identifies five criteria of effective leadership and none said works in an office, has a particular title. Leadership actually occurs everywhere. Now, we know this here at The Mentoree because we work with teachers, consultants, principals, vice principals, coaches, one-on-one. -on -one. We work with them in small and large groups. Um, and I think even though we all know this somehow, we all know that leadership happens everywhere, I think all too often our scope of leadership in education is actually narrow. So we've got five of us here today. We've got four guests plus myself, all of who uh, have navigated a path uh, to leadership in education. So where our current four panelists sort of stopped or currently sit on that journey differs, but I suspect that very few would hesitate to use the word leader to define who they are or to use the word leadership to describe what they do. And it's through their individual journeys that we hope to broaden our perspective tonight and widen the lens through which we examine and define leadership. So each participant will in turn introduce themselves and share an element of their story. We'll pause at the end of their story to allow for questions or comments or clarification. We're then gonna move on to our next panelist who will also introduce themselves until everyone has shared a piece of their leadership journey. Once everyone has done so, we'll open up for further discussion and questions uh, hopefully you've got a few. I've got a few of my own. If you are listening live and you want to use our hashtag, you can do so. And it is at OnEdMentor. So that's O-N-E-D-M-E-N-T-O-R-S. Um, so, you know, please, by all means, share some, some questions. And uh, if you have a chance to be here live, then Christine will offer you the floor or, or you can place that in a chat. I again want to thank uh, the four of you, as well as Christine, for joining us today. We look forward to hearing your stories. So as I mentioned at the start, uh, my name is Peter LeBlanc. I'm a mentor, I'm an author, I'm a retired school leader, and I'm a moderator of today's roundtable discussion. I hope that today will actually help you reflect on your own leadership journey, perhaps even reframe what it means to be a leader and to widen the lens through which you look and through we look at and define leadership. 
So by way of an introduction for myself, I just wanted to briefly share an aspect of my own story. Noah, actually, when we were talking about planning, suggested this might provide some context. I also figure it might answer the question of who the heck this person is who's moderating this chat. So I'll be brief. Oh, for me, leadership in education is, is critical. I, I just finished an, I'll say, almost 30-year career in the classroom, the office, the board office as a central principal, and I and on a military base. Um, I spend my time teaching in the classroom as an itinerant core French teacher. I was a classroom immersion teacher. I was an English teacher. I taught specialized special education to students um, whose behavior was challenging enough in a regular classroom setting. In formal leadership, I worked in five different schools. I worked at the board office and I finished off actually, I think with the most interesting job of all, I was seconded to the military, the Canadian military to work as the principal at their uh, school in Belgium. And it was while I was reflecting on this journey, I was actually reminded of an experience that it spanned eight of the 11 years I spent in the classroom. It actually happened at three different schools. And it was one of those experiences I didn't actually realize was a leadership experience until somebody else pointed it out to me. So I thought that this story and it's brief might lend itself well to today's kind of conversation. The leadership experience was a floor hockey league. Now, I want to flesh this out a little bit. So it was a lunchtime initiative that my friend and my teaching colleague, John, and I started and ran. At its peak, it had hundreds of kids playing in it. It gave dozens of students coaching and leadership opportunities. It raised thousands of dollars for various charities. And at one point, we actually had the, I think, now defunct Brampton Battalion come and join us and play in a game or two. But I would have never thought that this was a leadership story. I knew it was impactful because when I run into ex-students, it is easily the most frequent memory that they share with me. But leadership, I didn't think so until my vice principal at the time, while he was writing my own, my reference letter to try and become a VP, he actually dedicated an entire paragraph to this initiative. He said it was like no other leadership initiative he'd ever seen. It had an impact on the culture of the entire school. It gave students an opportunity to shine, to lead. It gave them voice because we had students refereeing games. We had them doing play-by-play -play and making announcements. And it actually made the community we served, because we are in service, a much better place. So I wanted to share that story as, as one of many leadership stories and maybe a small part of the journeys that you'll hear tonight from the other panelists. The one I chose to share actually comes a little from an unconventional space, and it highlights a theme for tonight that our lens that looks at leadership might need to broaden and that not all leadership comes from a position or an office or a title. So with that story to lead us off, maybe get us primed or maybe give you a chance to settle in or go to the bathroom and get something to drink, I'd like to hand things over to our panelists now. So we'll go Marguerite, then Che and Pav and Brenda, who will share their leadership stories. Marguerite, we would love to hear from you first. That's great. Thank you, Peter. Um, I love that introduction. So much of what we do in teaching, it really is about these moments and you just never know um, how or what impact you have at the time. Uh, so I will tell you a little bit about my leadership journey as I was thinking about this. I realized it, um, it may not feel linear. Um, it, uh, because it's, it's not linear. My journey has been kind of all over the place. And I realized that in many cases, a lot of what's happened to me um, has been based on people. And I thought, I, you know, I'd start with my mom because she just happened to have me first. I'm the oldest of four. I am the only girl. And uh, as my brothers and uh, many of you siblings uh, who have older siblings will tell you, um, we firstborns have a tendency to lead in the traditional um, thought about it, whether you want us to or not. Um, and then I think, you know, aside from, you know, aside, all jokes aside, I think we have, um, I was never going to be a teacher. I was going to be a business person. I went to university and um, my mom's a teacher, all kinds of teachers in the family. Of course I was but my act of defiance was going to be that I was going to be a business person and uh, carry a briefcase and wear a white shirt with a blue tie. And I did that for a little while and then had children and then realized that <coughs> it is 
um, when your life revolves around children um, and teaching, you should probably uh, go to the faculty uh, and teach. And so my journey in leadership and education can, I've realized can kind of be divided into two sorts of areas. There's that instructional literacy journey that I took, and then there's the organizational journey. Um, and uh, so I thought I'd kind of divide it into those two. The instructional piece, of course, started with my oldest son. Um, Jamal is a, uh, was a reader very early. Um, he started kindergarten and was able to read. And when we went to see the teacher uh, in the end of September, she said, uh, do you know your son can read? I said, yeah, I know he can read. Um, but what I didn't realize at the time was that not all the children in his kindergarten class were reading. And um, that was the year that I was at the faculty and obviously came into contact with lots of children who were not reading. And I really struggled with trying to figure out why other people's children were not reading the same way my son's, my son was, given the fact that I, I really never taught him to read in the traditional sense. And so one of the things I did was um, I did an AQ course in reading. Um, and the first person as part of this leadership journey is Paul O'Brien. Paul was my reading part two instructor and one day came to visit me at my school when I was teaching my grade one, two, threes and said, you know, I, I, I see something in you. I like the questions you ask in class and I, it, do you want to teach the reading course? And I thought, holy smokes. Um, you know, it was a knee quivering moment, um, but I said, sure. Um, and so I started teaching reading part one and then I taught reading part two. And one of the things that happened when I was teaching reading part two was that I, I taught a young woman whose name was Mayumi Sasaki. And I'll come back to Mayumi in a minute. Um, but Paul retired and I took over as the principal of the AQ reading course. And that was a journey of um, literacy and learning and, and leadership of that piece. Um, Fast forward, I was the principal at Dundas School and Mayumi was on secondment at York and was the course director uh, for the program at the Regent Park site. Some of her students were placed at Dundas. One day she called me and said, Marguerite, my teaching partner's uh, going back to school and uh, you want this job. And I thought, wow, all right, I want this job. Mayumi said that she reminded me that I had taught her reading part two. And she said it was, you know, a great course that she had taken. And I started to laugh because the first time I taught reading part two, it was a disaster. And one of the pieces around leadership in your journey is you have to remember that when things are horrible and they feel like they're the worst, um, it, sometimes you just need to fix it. Um, and it was bad. I mean, I did, I totally agree. It was the first time I taught that course, it was the worst. And I decided I'm either going to stop teaching this or I'm going to make it better. So Mayumi was in my first class that I worked on. I spent hours preparing for that class. Um, anyhow, she remembered years later, um, I got seconded to York and Mayumi and I were teaching partners at the Regent Park site. And I'm going to say that that experience changed my life, that leadership experience, that, that framework of equity and diversity and social justice that I got during those three years um, gave me a language that I didn't know that I needed. It gave me a, 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 an educational research grounding in all the work that I have been doing around literacy and the fact that literacy as a as an equity issue as a way to ensure that children had choices um, was uh, it was framed that way for us so so that's kind of that literacy journey lots of other things happen but that's what I'll, what I'll tell you today and then the organizational piece of course um, kind of teacher to VP to principal to superintendent. The person who started all that was Bernice Blackman. 
Uh, she was a superintendent in Toronto. She visited my classroom uh, when I was a teacher uh, at PAPE. And she said, and I can see Bernice in front of me right now telling me there are no career vice principals in my family of schools. And she said, if you're going to join with us, you're going to be a principal. And I, again, that knee quaking moment, okay, sure. And started as a VP at Silver Springs, Bernice put me in a group with two, three other women who have subsequently become the rock of my leadership journey from an organizational perspective. That little group has grown a bit, but we have become um, the push for each other, the pull for each other, the get your act together, the kick in the butt, all of those um, for each other. And I have, I have made the phone call to them saying, you want this job multiple times. And it's worked from there. But the last little piece I want to tell you about, the last person was John Moy. And John was the previous director, or two directors ago, I guess, um, at the TDSB. And, uh, you know, John obviously had conversations with me when I was applying. He sat right beside me and could read my little note cards as I said my spiel. But John's impact on me was really when I was leaving. Um, I... Uh, I had sent him a message saying I'm going to retire uh, and and I know I thought I could stay longer but I'm going now and I'm going to go and do something that brings me joy and John called me and said come and talk to me about that so I went up to the fifth floor and had a conversation with John and we talked about lots of things and he did the you know we're we're so happy that you're with TDSB blah 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 but what I remember is him saying that the leadership that I have done in the Toronto District School Board and beyond is now I can take all of that and take all of those joyful moments that I've had and move forward as I lead in other ways and still kind of um, and make a connection and do um, what I need to do. So, um, this incredible journey has been amazing. The things that I do now, not working full-time for the Toronto District School Board, I have grandchildren. My oldest son, the one who could read before he was three, now has four-year-old twins who bring me a lot of joy. And I'm, and I'm teaching at the Faculty of Education, going back to those days of uh, being on succumbent at York, which was so impactful in my leadership journey. Um, so I hope that... Uh, uh, has given you just a little taste of how um, leadership is in moments. Um, as Peter talked about it, you, you will, you know, absorb those moments and find those moments that bring you joy and uh, and widen that uh, that lens. I guess is the description we're doing tonight. Uh, so thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, I, I love that 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 poignant piece at the end where you said leadership is is in moments. Um, so uh, thank you for that. And and as I was listening to, I was I was hearing you tell the stories about your mom and about Jamal and and Paul and and Bernice and Mayumi and 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 John Malloy and and the importance that people also play. You know whether it's in a professional connection or in a, in a personal connection. Um, you know that that idea. And, and for those of you that are following along in the hashtag, is you know Christine talked about you know the people in our life that kind of push and pull us to to move forward. So you know I, I want to thank you for for sharing that. Um, I, I'm going to ask our panelists too, sort of at the end to reflect on the question. I always think, you know, when, when we have, you know, whether it's 20 or 25 or 30 plus years, if we could go back to the self that we were, you, you know, mentioned about being in the faculty and kind of whisper in our ear so that we were sort of a person of impact to our younger self. You know, I, I want to ask you to answer that now, Marguerite, but maybe later on, if, you know, as we're kind of talking to, to think about, well, what, what would we say if if we were the mentor for our younger selves? Um, you know, what, what kind of what kind of wisdom would we would we provide? So, again, I want to I, I want to thank you for for sharing for sharing your story. Um, now, I'm going to to move to Che and Pav. 
and uh, who you know I, I know and who everybody knows have no problems introducing themselves. Uh, they introduced themselves and been doing so on a weekly basis for years now. So I'm going to turn it over to both of you. Thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you, Peter. And, uh, you know, I'll mix it up a little bit because I know you're familiar with our content. So you already know why am I talking first? Because Pav always do does the poignant introductions. But yes, it is uh, Che and Pav here to talk about sort of leadership from the teacher perspective. And so Pav, if you don't mind, I'll go first and just sort of share some of my insights. And then you. you correct all places that I misstepped and give the audience clarity, which of course is exactly what Margarita and Peter were talking about, that leadership's not an isolated journey. I think sometimes we get so uh, caught up and, and right or wrong in our self-actualization and our journey that we don't always see. Sometimes we are really cognitively aware of who's helping us, but I think a lot of the time we are unaware of how many people around us are supporting our infrastructure that is allowing us to grow. And so when I think of leadership, Margaret, you talked about this as well, this, this linear path. And I think what happens is, is that we turn our narrative into a linear story for easy consumption. And then I think it manifests in how we teach necessarily. Uh, it could be anything, but let's say back to leadership is that we turn leadership often into a series of steps, or if you do these things, and it's a manifestation of narrations that are caught after the fact, where we try to piece everything together, but they are, there is a beautiful mess. It's a randomness to leadership. And as you grow, the pieces, they, they, they fit in place, and then some don't fit. But ultimately, you come back and say, they were all part of my growth. I think of me as a young teacher, that's a long time ago, like and a few hairs left, but it, like this is a long time ago. I remember fresh in the board and it was at a time when they were actually pushing and emphasizing male leadership. And I remember going to an all males aspiring leaders course in the TDSB, which now I would think we would, we would never have such a space um, for all the right reasons. And I think back that at that time, early on in my career, I got caught in the narrative of, wait, may, maybe this is what I want to do. And I use this sort of a, it's gonna be sort of a deficit story with a asset story at the end is that early on, I sort of got caught in the narrative and began chasing leadership. And I began associating leadership with the position. I, I, I thought of leadership as, as a noun rather than trying to think of leadership rather as a verb. And so early on in my career, three years in, four years in, I was already thinking maybe I could be a principal. and. You know, I did all the you know, some reading courses. I took some leadership courses. I became a school chair. I dove into that space and it didn't go as magnificently as I thought it was going to go. And in hindsight, it, throughout a time has passed, I realized that for me, and this isn't necessarily the definitive thing that you need to do for leadership, but I rushed too fast, maybe caught caught up in the assumption of being co-opted by power and associated too much leadership with position. And I had to build up wisdom. Uh, self-actualization through experience, through going through more courses, to become more comfortable with who I was as a teacher, to start to understand that I'm a leader, my students are a leader, everyone's a leader actually all the time. You don't choose when or when not to be a leader. It's like making an impact. You're always making an impact. The question is, are you really aware of the impact you're making or are you really cavalier with the impact you're making? And so I always like to assert that, that everyone's a leader and you're always leading. The question is, are you really mindful of it? Are you cognitively aware of it? And, and I think as I grew older, I became more comfortable and more confident in my role. And I stopped pursuing leadership as a title. And I became very comfortable being a, a sort of the mentor text for leaders in the space. I wanted to be a leader in my classroom. And I was hoping that um, how my students would identify me is what uh, the message I was trying to to portray. Because quite often when students come into the class, it, I always say, it's not for me to tell you who I am. I'm a 45 year old white male teaching in Rexdale. You know what's more valuable? Ask your peers, ask students from last year. They'll tell you better what I am or who I am to this community and to you in the classroom space. And so I was always very aware of, of trying to create myself as a mentor text that was um, seen as, Marguerite brought this terminology up as well, a real advocate, a real ally, a real social justice warrior. But of course, I cannot anoint myself these things, nor would I even anoint myself them now. These are goals. These are aspirations. And I hope students see a little bit in that in me that will inspire to do a little bit of that in them. And even conversely, you know, I'll learn a little bit from them and their leadership. So I think of this leadership journey as, as its collective growth. And for me, 
I consider myself a leader. Sometimes I get a chuckle when administrators come in, you know, you know, Jay, you, you got some leadership potential. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Thank you. Um, leaders all around you. And so I'm very happy where I am as a leader, not actually ascending to anything further, but doing all the things that would help me ascend technically in the position taking lots of courses, doing lots of reading, um, doing lots of, of self-driven PD. I know, I think what Pav and I talk about is that with our podcast experience that this is, this is the type of learning we want from our learners. This is the type of learner we're modeling for the educational space. We, we, we receive the benefit we receive is the personal growth from all the interviews we have and all the people we connect with and all the self-reflection we do. And this is modeling leadership, uh, or at least we hope it's modeling leadership. So I'm probably being redundant, but you know, that's what teachers do. My mother tells me all the time, I repeat myself. I said, this is a teacher tactic. Um, is that I thought of myself chasing leadership too, too early on, making a very narrow gatekeeping assertion of what leadership was, and have become much more comfortable with what leadership is through growth, uh, through validation of people around me. Marguerite dropped so many names. I wish I could drop so many names, but I, I'll give one example. Pat, you know, you've heard the story many times. I always look at Rose Neese Jackson as my inspiration as a leader. And it, it comes with some layers and complexities because often we talk about, you know, we want these really great relationships and these relationships manifest everything. But I always was really open and uh, Rosie and I were always very good with this. We didn't have the greatest relationship, but she inspired because the things that I saw in her, things that I wanted, she was smart. She was intelligent. She was a doer. And that really resonated with me. And I think when I think of who am I now, I, I, I maybe not, Pavel probably like nod ahead. I'm probably not the best relationship builder, but I think everyone knows that, uh, that I'm a doer, uh, that I have a clear vision and I'm going to support and I'm going to go all out. And maybe I want to work on my relationship building skills, but I always think of, of Rosneath Jackson in that sense that she... Uh, honored the work I was doing. And if I've in when I was a teacher, then I always thought of a little, little bit rebellious, but she backed that rebellion. And when you're a rebellious teacher, or you think you're a rebellious teacher, always be mindful. There are people that allow you and, and curate a space for you. And Rose Neath Jackson let me do explorative things and wild things. And it went well. She supported and not just vernacular, performative vernacular, but resources. I remember like when there was no tech in the TDSB, I'm tongue in cheek. There was some tech, but I, I brought in, I bought two of my own iPads, did a whole bunch of stuff. And Roseneath bought 20 iPads the next year. And so I always think of that, that leadership inspired me, which always reminds me of that great mentor text, see and observe. And although we know there's certain character traits that we, we want to have, we know we want powerful relationships, but also there, there's something behind being really wise and just supporting people and supporting people beyond the performative and I think where I lie now is I consider myself a leader I consider everyone around me a leader and I'm very pleased that 20 years in I'm a teacher and in 10 more years when I retire I'll still be a teacher and still be a leader Pav fill all the holes please uh, the only hole that I think I'm going to fill is uh, you think you're going to be retired in 10 years. <laughs> um, I wish I could say that that would be true. But uh, thank you so much for your stories. And Marguerite, thank you so much for your story as well. Um, so much of what you said, Che, just now echoes uh, so many of my feelings as well as a teacher. And uh, Che and I both teach in the Rexdale community. And that's the only community that uh, us that we both have ever taught in. Uh, so it's it's all we really know. And um, 15 and 20 years in, we've had a lot of experiences and we are both still teaching. We are active practitioners. Um, and I would say that we are both leaders. Uh, but this is something that took a long time for me to actualize, to see myself as, as that. Because just like Che and just like so many other teachers um, at the beginnings of our careers, we... Uh, you know, leadership was very synonymous with that positional power, that uh, the organizational structure of that linear sort of ascension to uh, principal and then to superintendent or whatever it is that you're you're, um, you're trying to build up to. And, and I think that that assumption was really where I um, faltered and I, I made some of my mistakes in in you know, sort of not thinking of myself as that. Although other people would point it out to me, or oh, you're a great leader, or oh, you run great programs, or you you do this and that. I just never saw it in myself because that's not the way that it was defined for me, um, or that's not the way that I I had seen it being presented uh, either when I was a student or just beginning my career. 
Um, and so for myself, it took a lot of mentorship as well for me to discover that leadership leadership comes in many forms. Uh, there was no book that I ever read that was, you know, all teachers are leaders too, or defining leadership in education. There was there was nothing for me to follow in that regard. It took a long time. It took a lot of wisdom. It took a lot of collective growth. Um, it took a lot of people to to show me what leadership could look like. Um, and so I sort of created my own sort of definition of what that leadership was like. It, it started with um, ideation and creating ideas and taking ownership of those ideas, um, taking the initiative to implement the, those ideas based on the needs that you see that are in front of you, uh, following up and following through with those initiatives. And, and then to, to see myself as someone who could provide in those situations as well, either as myself or with teammates. Um, and I think that that's where my leadership journey sort of my story begins to be told because there are many things that I, I feel that I have done in my 15 years of education as an individual that I would say I've been a great leader with starting programs like robotics programs and coding programs and getting girls interested, which was a real big challenge, especially in the beginning where um, it was it was a really tough sell. So uh, starting a, a program that was more mentorship based and saying, OK, you know, I want everyone to be uh, coming out to these to these coding sessions, um, not because I think that you're great coders, which you all likely are, but I think that you're great mentors for the younger uh, students in the class. And I think that you would provide great mentorship and helping them learn how to code. And so I was able to, um, you know, create these programs based on the needs that I had seen. And, and so many of us, so many teachers do this on a daily basis. And so we should be seeing ourselves as leaders when we create those opportunities for students um, or for other staff members, um, you know, doing lunch and learns. I, I've been doing uh, little PD sessions uh, for years for the staff at the school. And I never thought that that was a leadership thing. That was always just like, well, I know how to do this. Sure. Okay. You want me to teach it to you? Of course I will. And so many of us do this on a daily basis. Um, that is leadership. Uh, and, and then there's also that partnership leadership of recognizing that I may not be able to take the lead on a particular thing, but I can lend my support in so many different ways. And so I'm going to put myself out there because I recognize that there is a need for this and I can provide uh, the, the things that I can provide to support. That is leadership, recognizing that there is a need, that there is a hole that needs to be filled and knowing that you have the power to be able to fill that hole. Um, and and I would probably assert our podcasting journey to to that partnership, uh, to that leadership that we have provided. Uh, that took a little bit more reflection to say, hey, you know what? I think that we're providing some professional development in the many different ways that we are doing, whether it's presentations for unleashing learning or whether it's uh, presenting at conferences. And we just had uh, MassQ yesterday and we've got the Ontario Library Associ Association on the weekend um, providing those PD sessions. That is leadership. I mean, those are things that uh, that we're not getting paid to do, but we have we recognize that there is something that we can offer to other teachers in, in order for them to be able to uh, gain knowledge and understanding in a particular area of, of education, somewhere where we have uh, really been honored and blessed to be able to gain that knowledge in. Um, and we've offered it up. We were sharing the things that we have learned and, and that is leadership. Um, developing the podcast, although it, it had uh, selfish beginnings, it was for our own reflection and for our own sort of way to decompress at the end of every week. Um, over time, we have recognized that the, the conversations that we have are many of the same conversations that many educators have on a daily basis, those hallway conversations and recording them and putting them out and not just putting them out for people to listen to, but as conversation starters for educators and conversation starters that lead to even greater conversations and problem solving and recognition of the problems that are out there in the first place. Um, that is leadership. And so um, although I never had seen myself as somebody who could ascend to um, becoming a principal or or to to gaining some sort of um, 
ascension within the organizational structure within teaching. Um, it, it took me some time to realize that the things that I was able to offer and the things that I was providing to the students, to the staff, to my peers, to my colleagues, to teachers on the other side of the world, these are all leadership things that we are doing. And, uh, and, and I now take a lot of pride in that and knowing that, um, that the work that we do, the effort that we put into our craft is, uh, is not just helping the students, but helping other educators as well. And so that's, uh, that's my leadership story. And I think that I've learned a lot from listening to you, Che and Marguerite, and I'm sure that I'm going to continue to learn listening to uh, the rest of the panel. And so this has been a great opportunity for us to share and see what leadership really does look like from different perspectives and in different places within education, because it does come from everywhere. Uh, it is based on many different moments, and uh, it is important for us to reflect and continue to look back at um, the things that have shaped us and how we continue to be shaped in the future as well. Thank you both. Um, I find it interesting with all the information that you shared, there seemed to be almost an underlying theme, I won't say of uncertainty of leadership, but it's like, Am I leading? Am I not? And and that 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 point, I think, where we, you know, where we sort of define ourselves and say, yeah, I'm I'm okay actually taking on that role of leader. And I I actually find it interesting, in particularly to the two of you, because um, I I know you through your podcast, and I've I've been very open, I think, to both of you, and and you know, in social media, how much I have learned from listening to your podcast and how I would, without hesitation, like Che, when you said, oh, principal walked into my classroom and said, you know, you've got some leadership potential. I kind of chuckle at that because I'm like, I would easily define you as leaders because for, you know, for myself and for many others, you, you kind of promote that idea of, of, of lifelong learning and that continuous uh, opportunity to freely offer your practice and to put yourselves out there. So, um, you know, those those themes that have kind of run through that leadership does come from everywhere, that it comes from the classroom, it doesn't necessarily come from position, I think, you know, runs itself quite well through the the, the narrative thread that you've both shared with us. So I, I want to thank you. Thank you again for, for, for doing so. Um, before I hand things over to Brenda, though, I did want to just mention to her when we talk about the idea of learning, I can actually recall some learning of my own at Brenda's hands. Now, Brenda was working, and I don't know if you remember this, you were working as a vice principal, and I'm, I'm going to guess it's about eight or nine years ago, and you revisited how communities share information on Remembrance Day. So you had, um, at the school you were working at, and I remember the name, I won't share it if you want to, you're more than welcome to, but um, on how we view Remembrance Day as a community activity, and you had gone out to the community to share pictures of, I believe, what Remembrance Day meant for them or connections that they could make to Remembrance Day. And probably unbeknownst to you, that that really resonated with me. And I've actually carried that forward. And then at my last school, which was in fact a military school where Remembrance Day had a, a large significance for families, we actually recreated that activity when we couldn't have um, a commemoration of Remembrance Day because of COVID, because we were online actually reached out to the community to do just that, to share pictures that meant something to them around Remembrance Day. And the poignancy of that experience was something else. So I just wanted to share how, you, probably unbeknownst to you, how something that you did and shared publicly actually had an impact on my own practice, my own leadership practice. Again, highlighting the idea that one, leadership comes from anywhere and everywhere, and that we may not be aware of the impact that our actions have on other people's, you know, very, you know, as as, as Che pointed out, very um, cir circuitous journey uh, of our leadership narrative. So on that note, Brenda, I pass things on to you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Peter. Oh, funny that you should say that because uh, that activity came out of my first year as a vice principal and we'd been talking a lot around 21st century learning about crowdsourcing of course, you know, crowdsourcing in terms of our activities that we have with students. And um, I went to a session that Annie Kidder lit, led from People with People for Education. And she talked about how so many of our parents are engaged, but they can't be there during the day. And so that's where that came from. It's like, right, like, how can we evolve? How can we crowdsource that involvement? 
to our families who aren't able to be there during the day. And it was funny because um, later, I think the next year, my sister-in-law says, hey, I saw a picture of your grandfather um, in my son's school in Milton. And so, you know, it's funny when you have a global uh, network, how things grow and people share your ideas. And I just love that. It's amazing that that lives on. So thank you for taking that and growing it forward. Um, so I thought it was going to be easy being third, but I really find after hearing I, both, all of your stories, I have so many connections to what you were saying. So that idea that most people mentioned earlier about this being a messy conversation is really accurate for myself as well. Um, when you said at first leadership journey, I really think of my journey as a learning journey, not a leadership journey necessarily. And it's all about relationship for me and relationships I've been able to, to make with all, a lot of people um, in, in Ontario and beyond. And so I have a worry right now in talking about my story that I may not, um, you know, uh, give credit to all, all of the people in my journey, but I want to know, I want, you know, who you are. So I hope I don't, uh, I hope I do do a good job with that. But um, I think in terms of my, and unlike Marguerite, um, I always wanted to be a teacher and um, I began I, with a fascination around learning. And so I started in recreation programs when I was about 15. And actually Highfield was one of my recreation sites in Etobicoke that I worked in. So um, our panelists will know that, that area. And um, I let, I guess I, I learned in, in that, uh, I was a, like a program coordinator and a special events coordinator later. Um, I learned that we can't make people do things, right? And then I, I studied psychology after that. And well, we can make people do things, but it doesn't last. And so what we have to do is can create conditions that motivate folks to jump in and start somewhere and uh, learn and improve themselves. And so that's where I started. And I think that's kind of been my philosophy as an educator all along. Um, I, I uh, actually, at after doing that job for a couple of years, I noticed that in Etobicoke, we had no programs for special needs students at the time. So this would be like in 1980. Five maybe, and um, so for some reason, um, I felt like I had the confidence to propose to the director of that Parks and Recreation in Etobicoke that we should have an integrated program for special needs students, and she said, "Okay, go for it." So I think um, learning is my my one one thing that I I focus on a lot um, in my journey, and then jumping in. I love starting new things. I love being the first one to try things. And, and I didn't really realize that about myself until, you know, I reflected back um, to notice that. So it's really interesting how it is. It is like others have said tonight, not a linear journey. It's a bit of a roadmap, but it's all over the place. So I began um, teaching in 1987 after having that lovely experience of doing that in senior uh, recreation program. Um, in, in TDSB, and I was fortunate to be placed in a, in a school that um, I, I found one of my first mentors, Kathy Gosling Spears, who I still am friends with and love teaching with um, to this day, as well as Nancy Moore, who really um, helped us um, focus on our practice as re researchers, I would say, uh, really diving into what teaching is. And with the support, you know, as a brand new teacher, boy, I was really lucky, lucky to have that. And so I spent my first 20 years in the classroom and in special education. So I did not feel like I had the wisdom, like I heard late earlier, yet to become a formal, former le formal leader. Um, I really was loved teaching, loved it, fascinated with learning, loved um, creating uh, the conditions for my learners to enjoy the classroom. Um, my children were little. I have two sons. My children were little at the time. And so I spent that time doing as much as I learning as I could that would be job embedded. Um, again, um, doing the role of special education coordinator in I, I, I then moved to Guelph to teach. So 
with Upper Grand, Wellington County first and then Upper Grand. So I, um, I was a special ed coordinator, um, stepped into that role because another lady had to leave. And so they were like, we wanted, could you do this, Brenda? And I'm like, yeah, I think I could do that. Okay. Um, so stepped into that, didn't say no. Um, and then our board also started reading recovery. And so I was the, one of the first in a cohort of small, small group to um, dive into reading recovery, which was amazing learning for me. And, you know, aligned with what Marguerite said, diving deeply into studying how children learn to read was just so fascinating. I loved it. And as well, um, the other thing about reading recovery is basically, you know, you brought along a five-year-old at 5 p.m. at night uh, in through one-way mirrors or two-way mirrors, and you taught while you were watched by your peers. And, um, you know, that was a real um, opportunity to, you know, deprivatize my practice, I guess we would say. Um, you know, I, I was never shy after that experience about having people in my classroom and co-teaching that's sort of what I love to do so that that networking piece too so about um 10 years in that's when that experience was, was happening and I was lucky enough to work with a principal named Helen Hornet and I would say she was the first one to sort of um say to me you know I think you could be a principal and I was like, no way, no way. That is not going to be my thing. I don't think I could do it. And she said, well, you know, you have some people skills that I think are really great and um, really nice way with people. And so that was the first time someone had said that kind of um, thing to me. And what I learned most from Helen, because I said to her one time, and this served me so well later on, I couldn't believe how much she had on her plate and how she could be so calm in all kinds of scenarios, because I was the special ed coordinator along with her. So I got to see in a window into her, her life as a principal, for sure. And I said, how do you do it? You know, you've got so much in your, on your mind, and yet, you know, you, you just seem so calm. And she mentioned, that's when I first started to learn about mindfulness, I think. She just said, I just prepare as best I can, and then I'm really present with people when I'm there. And so that was something that I took forward um, in my in my journey for sure. Um, and then as I was thinking about what to share today, because as the older you get, the longer your story is, um, I just thought, you know, learning, networking, and co-leading, I guess, are the three things that really stand um, in my mind as pillars for me, if, if you have to think of it as a leadership journey, which I don't generally, I just generally think of myself as a teacher. So because then I became a tech coach, and uh, again, first one in my board uh, to take on a coaching role, so that was great. Um, I had been working on my master's, and um at OSC with a, a special interest in constructivist technologies. And so, um, you know, like Pat said, I just, it was really natural for me to be learning about this portal to the world, the computer to be using with students. I'm going to share that. So I was doing a lot of informal workshops, um, coaching in that way. And I, I just fell in love with that idea of coaching. And so my network, my professional learning network then really helped me in that area. So I began working with Powerful Learning Practice with Cheryl Nosbaum Beach. Um, I did a little stint um, chairing the ECHO conference and with support from my colleague, Peter Skillen. And I had never even chaired a meeting at that point. And I was, and ECHO really was going to not be in place the next year. And they were saying they needed somebody to really chair the conference. I'm like, yeah, okay, I think I could do that. Um, and started, uh, built that team to um to have that conference go so that was great and then um along the way i was able to teach the aq courses at uh, sir wilford laurier around technology in the classroom so that was pretty fantastic and then i had a small um a small time as a vice principal just two years and they they were sort of back um sandwiched in between um uh, a secondment at the Ministry of Education in the 21st Century Learning Unit. So um, I think what I would say is, is kind of like what Mar Marguerite said. I had no strategy around what um, my journey was going to look like other than I wanted to keep learning, keep meeting people, 
keep connecting, keep um, working on really authentic projects with folks. And so um, I have retired. I, I call it rewired, actually, because now I'm working into amazing projects, Connected North and Advanced Learning Partnership, where I get to mentor and elevate women in STEM and girls who game and all kinds of fun stuff. So, you know, um, I think, you know, if you're, if you love as much as I do, education as a profession, as a lifelong journey, um, it is one step at a time and everything you do prepare, prepares you to embrace change and take on something else. So that's, um, that's my story, I would say. Um, and I look forward to questions and talking some more with folks because I really wanted to jump in and have conversation with you after you were sharing your stories. Well, and, and the stories have been so fascinating. That's the thing, you know, we're, we're coming down to a little less than 10 minutes and I agree with you. It would have been nice, um, you know, to have a little bit of a chat. We'll probably have time for one or two questions. The, the one thing I'm going to mention before I is I, I'm stealing rewired that that that's a term that I I'm, I'm taking yeah. now. So, you know, as much as <laughs> I borrowed, I talked to you about, you I talked to you about boring one of your activities. I'm that's <laughs> correct. I'm using the word rewired, but um, I, I loved early on. You actually talked about, you know, jumping in and, and you talked about little steps and, and I'm not sure if you caught it or not, but the, the it was almost the term of, you know, Oh yeah, I can do that. It, it was, I, I really got a sense of that. Um, of that risk-taking initiative, well, you know, or sort of that, well, I don't know what this is, but I'm prepared to give it a try and, and, and we'll see. And, and, and thank you for sharing that. Cause I think that that's a, that's a component of leadership that kind of links to what was talked about earlier is that, you know, leadership is a messy journey. It doesn't have, we have a narrative we kind of tell ourselves, which is linear, but the reality of the story isn't linear at all. Um, so again, I, I, I want to, yeah, of course, of course. Um, because I forgot to say that Marguerite was actually my P my PQP part one instructor, right? So, you know, I'm really excited to be here with her. And I, we've come across our paths a few times uh, since since we both have retired. So um, she's also rewired, not exactly retired <laughs> as well. But yeah, so, you know, like, it's just amazing the the uh, mentors I've had along the way. Yeah. And, and, and just to, to, to kind of highlight some of the themes that we've heard as well, we've talked about the importance of people and relationships, that idea of continuous learning and learning that still happens even in the phase of rewiring, you know, Chase said 10 years from now. Well, again, you've got a new term now, so you're going to retire or rewire 10 years from now, but that the learning continues. We talked about a messy journey. Uh, and we, I think all stories have kind of highlighted the idea that leadership really does come from every, from everywhere and anywhere. We have one question uh, that uh, I'd ask uh, if anyone on the panel would like to address, and, and that comes from uh, our, our Twitter chat. How do you navigate work-life balance as a leader? Probably a, a critical question at any time, but actually very important today. So that was Terry asking the question. And does anyone want to take that one on? You know, it's funny. I think I might just because the mother of three running through all this stuff, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, and one of the things that I've realized, again, I think it's about people. I think we, especially women in, in the profession, I think we have decided or taken on this thing that we see on television, that there's no one who's going to support us and no one's going to allow us to, you know, leave early when we got to go pick up kids and all those, all those things. And I think the reality is that's not true. And I think the more we reach out and connect with folks, we are able to, I mean, there's never a balance. It, that's just a, that whole word is just a fallacy. Balance does not happen. There are times when it's your family, there are times when it's your work. It's just, it's never balanced. Um, but I, I do remember when I was going through to promote it to be a principal, I remember saying to Bernice, I cannot parent from a car. I can't do it. And at that point, I was 35 minutes from my house. And people will say, holy cow, 35 minutes, that's crazy. I do two hours, whatever. But I realized that I needed help. I couldn't do that. There were three of them. I just, and, and she said, okay, go back downtown. And, but I had such angst about talking to her about that. And I think that's one of the pieces is we just have to 
honor the fact that people want us to succeed. And if we start with that premise, um, then uh, yes, of course, you're going to run into people who say, are you crazy? You know, you got to give 100% of the job, blah, blah, blah. But I think those are, there are fewer of those than there are people who want us to succeed and are willing to um, do what will, uh, what will help. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else want to jump in? And also thinking too, you know, around particularly now working, you know, in, in a school or school setting around that that work life balance. I don't know if either Pav or Che wanted to wanted to jump in uh, and add, you know, a, a tidbit of information around. I don't want to say survival, but certainly around work life balance in, in a current climate. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was gonna uh, just piggyback a little bit on what Marguerite had just said about uh, there is no balance. Um, I, I would agree with that. There really isn't. But I think that it is possible to achieve some flow. And to really go with that when when it is your 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 children that that need you to be there for them a little bit more than your attention, just shift it slightly away. And and as Marguerite said, people will support you. I mean, you you can find I've, I've built some great I've only been at the school where I'm at now for this is my second year. And I've already built like a, a fantastic support system uh, that I, I lean on on a regular basis. Um, and, and we provide that support for one another. And, and so when it's your kids that need you, when it's, you know, some other aspect of your life that needs you, um, take that time to, to go with that flow. Uh, and, then, and then also take some of your own personal self and include that as part of the flow as well. So, you know, do something that you absolutely love to do. And, and for myself, it's it's martial arts. For myself, it's uh, the podcast and and so much of the work that we are doing there. Those are those are passions that add to the quality of my educational life as well. And so I think that that is all part of that flow system of everything sort of just working together. And and it's that synergy that's created between all of those aspects of our lives. So I think that the more that we can internalize the fact that. Um, everything affects everything else. And so wherever your attention is needed, just sort of put it there for, for whatever you're, um, you're able to do and, and lean on those that are around you. I know that I lean on Che quite a bit too. He probably doesn't want to be leaned on that much, but, <laughs> but he gets it. Pav, if I could, you know, just uh, not even add on, just follow up uh, with those great comments. Is that sometimes when you when you shoulder it on yourself, you actually miss opportunities because it's like Margarita saying, people are here to elevate you. So I think of how many opportunities I may have missed because I was focused on what I wanted to do when people around me were were gifting me opportunities, gifting me experience. But I was so headstrong, especially early on, that I, that I knew the path that I missed opportunities. And there, there's something to finding that flow of slowing down, observe what other people are doing, gift people your insights, your opportunities, and they're going to re-gift us, that whole gift economy. So I just love those touching points. Your community provides you, you know, access points to new things. I would never have presented anywhere because I was so fixated on what I was doing in my classroom. Uh, but slow down and people gift you opportunities because they see the work you're doing. So I, I really like you bringing that point on, the, the, that toxic problem productivity is out there, but it's not as overwhelming as people sort of think it is. There really is a really great group of folks that want to see everyone do well. So you find that flow and, and people are there to, to help you because you're there to help them. It's all about servant leadership. Yeah. And, and I would just jump in when you said toxic productivity, the kind of work we need to be doing right now is adapted. The adaptive challenges that we're faced all the time are so messy and complicated that we never know where the answers are going to come for those things. And as leaders, formal or informal in our schools, we need to realize that, um, you know, we have to have safe places to work and to, to live. And um, in order to have safe places, we need to get to know each other and understand each other in a more holistic way. Our students, too, because our, sometimes the answers are coming from our students, not from us as leaders. So we have to work together. So, yeah, that balance of just, you know, sharing what your challenges and your successes are with others, I think it's super important. Yes, yeah, so it sounds like, you know, that that people do want us to succeed. And, and again, we've got that theme of, of people, that that continuous relationship and the people that we that, that we can lean on. Um, we're coming to the end of our time together. 
So I, I want to, uh, as we were talking about leadership journey, I just want to highlight one point in the next step of the leadership journey with the mentoree. So one of our next stages of leadership focus is going to be to support those who are either at or near the process of application for formal leadership. So our hope is actually to tailor a one hour session that's gonna answer questions, provide you with general guidance that is applicable to a wide range of formal system positions that you might either be currently applying to or considering applying to. So that will take place on Wednesday, February the 23rd, 7.30 Eastern time. Registration is free and it can be done at mentory.com slash marketplace. Uh, Christine, I know you're in the background there. I want to say a huge thank you to you for keeping it all together. A shout out and a thanks to Noah Daniel because, you know, her work is continuous here and her inspiration is continuous. Marguerite, Pav, Che, Brenda, thank you for your time today. Thank you for your uh, expertise. Most importantly, though, I want to thank you for your leadership stories. Uh, Christine, did you have anything that you wanted to add at the end? Because if not, uh, what I'll do is, yeah. <laughs> if not, then I will hope that everyone learned a little bit, uh, reflected a little bit, and were able to revisit and kind of reframe both the stories that you heard today, but really your own leadership story. That's it for all of us, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. That was great. Thank you.